Well, thank you everyone for joining us for the second panel in the International Conference on Taxpayer Rights. Um, our first panel was, I think, quite fascinating and really sets up not just the theme for this, this the whole conference, but also leads beautifully into this, in this second panel. And um, the theme of the second panel is taxation as a means to achieving sustainable development goals in Africa and other development developing countries. But this can go beyond to actually developed countries as well. So um, without further ado, I will hand this over to Sancia Blackmore of the um, African Tax Institute at the University of Pretoria. Sancia? <laughs> Thank you very much, Nina. And of course, <clears throat> a very warm welcome to everybody to, to panel two of this international conference on taxpayer rights. Now, as Nina's mentioned, this session deals with how taxation may be used as one of the tools to pursue the sustainable development goals, but specifically how a balance may be struck between the taxpayers' rights and the large demands made of them to fund this development path. Now, I will try to briefly summarize what, what I think this topic is about, and it will have a slightly South African flavor. Now, more than 260 years ago, in 1755 to be precise, Adam Smith proclaimed what it is that governments must do to encourage development. And this is what he said. Little else is requisite to carry a state to the highest degree of opulence from the lowest barbarism, but peace, easy taxes, and the tolerable administration of justice, all the rest being brought about by the natural cause of things, typical Adam Smith. Now we know, of course, that there is no such thing as easy taxes. In modern terminology, I presume this would have meant taxes that are collected from a broad base at a reasonable cost and that are complied with relatively voluntarily. And of course, none of this is easy to achieve. If taxes were easy, I guess we would have been a lot less concerned about how we would chart the recovery path out of the COVID-19 pandemic. As it is, and I speak from a South African perspective, which is at least somewhat representative of the situation that developing countries face, especially on our continent. Now, there are legitimate concerns about how this recovery will be accomplished. Now, in South Africa, more than a third of our workforce is unemployed. Of our population of 60 million, 18 and a half million, so nearly a third of our entire population live on state welfare, consisting of minimal amounts barely covering on average the international poverty threshold of $1.90 a day. We have approximately 5.8 million assessed taxpayers, fewer than 10% of our population. So South Africa has a narrow tax base and a very concentrated tax burden and not necessarily on the wealthiest individuals or corporations either. Now, the Oxfam index measuring countries' commitment to reduce inequality, the so-called CRI index, ranks the South African tax structure as the most progressive globally. And rightly so, we are also the most unequal in terms of income distribution. The trouble is that in that same Oxfam index, the pillar measuring progressivity in service delivery, that is on the expenditure side, ranks South Africa much lower at about 44. So this wedge between very progressive taxation on the one hand and much less progressive expenditure makes it clear how much pressure there is on taxpayers. Now this is also an environment where extensive corruption and state capture and even patronage have been revealed during a recent commission of inquiry known as the Zonda Commission. The Zonda report is not finished yet, but it's not difficult to predict that the oral testimony revealing such massive diversion of taxpayer money may not bode well for tax morale and compliance. Now, speaking more broadly, I think it's safe to say that relationships between states and citizens have become 
increasingly problematic over the past 18 to 20 months. Globally, a decline in freedom is reported on the many indices that measure freedom, with a rise in authoritarianism and strongmen, and increased repression of political opposition and human rights activists. So the boundaries of freedoms and civic rights have closed in on the citizenry of many countries. So this makes the social contracts for, that we now face increasingly complex. And the fiscal contract, of course, is at the center of this storm as the tax bases shrink and there's rising public obligations in the form of social security and health expenditures specifically. And this is all tightening the pressure on taxpayers. In addition, as contracts go, the fiscal contract, of course, is uniquely one-sided. Taxpayer obligations are enforced rather more relentlessly than the state's obligation to spend tax revenue well and to govern honestly. So taxpayer rights do not include opting out. There is no withholding right if governments renege on their obligations via the citizenry. So precluding a tax revolt, taxpayers must then resort to the ballot to renegotiate the fiscal contract. This, however, may prove inadequate to enforce accountability where taxpayers carrying the brunt of the tax burden constitute less than 10% of the total population or 14.5% of the voting population, as is the case in South Africa. And so, frustrated at the ballot box, they may threaten tax revolts instead, and this naturally does not serve development objectives. So we would very much like to hear from the panelists what their views are. Our panelists will each do a presentation of about 20 minutes, following which there will be some discussion amongst the panelists and then followed by a question and answer session um, of about 30 minutes or so. And you are most welcome to just use the chat function on your screen to direct questions to the panel in general or to a particular panelist. And our panel consists of three experts in the field of tax and development, and we are very privileged to have them here. I will introduce them briefly. Our first presentation will be by Dr. Johanna Mugler from the Institute of Social Anthropology at the Bern University in Switzerland. Next, we will have Professor Annette Ugutu from the African Tax Institute and also the Department of Taxation at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. And our final panelist is Professor Art Helge Fjeldstad. He is the chair of the Christian Mikkelsen Institute in Norway and also a professor at the African Institute at the University of Pretoria. So thank you, Johanna. If you are ready to proceed, we are Looking forward to your presentation. Great. Can you see the first slide? Well, okay. And I apologize that there's so much sun on me. It was supposed to be a very rainy day in Zurich, but right now the sun, as you can see, is shining. So <laughs> I hope that it's not disturbing. Um, yeah. As Santia already mentioned, this. Sorry, I didn't do change it. Okay. Um, this panel wants to explore how taxation can play a significant role in achieving many of the, of the sustainable development goals and the importance of taxpayer rights in engaging taxpayers as part of this effort. This is a very big question and, and a question I cannot answer. The people in the audience and also my co-panelists can answer that question probably much better. Um, I'm an anthropologist I'm interested in taxation very much and, and international norms, and but anthropologists wouldn't ask that question, not because it's not a good question, but because my discipline asks different kind of questions. And I think that's why Nina Olsen um, invited me to participate in this panel, and I'm very pleased to be here. In, in my presentation, I want to share four thoughts of what an anthropological perspective onto taxation, sustainable development goals, and taxpayer rights 
looks like and by doing that hopefully contribute to the debate of the panel. Yeah, anthropologists wouldn't ask that question firstly because the discipline has only more recently been interested in taxation, um, only very recently one can say over the last 10 years maybe that there is something like an anthropo anthropology of taxation. Indirectly, the discipline, however, has been very much interested in taxation for a long time because especially economic anthropologists have been interested in matters of distribution since the beginning of the discipline and have been asking questions such as how do people share, with whom do they share, what and when, and then for what reasons do they share. Putting the, putting the question in this way doesn't assume that one needs to find resources to finance development and to generate innovation, economic growth, jobs, and therefore revenue, which then can be distributed. Anthropologists such as Tanya Lee, for example, argues that this assumption is false because that moment of distribution never comes. Such a such a approach focuses on, on rights um, versus means. We know um, through the work of economists like Thomas Piketty or Branko Minalovic, um, you might be more familiar with than my colleague Tanya Lee, um, we know that the dynamics of wealth captured by different income groups globally since the 1980s is, is highly uneven. I could have shown you their famous elephant curve, but I thought this image, although um, it's it comes from a different time and it's overly, um, you know, it's gender and and colorblind. It's it's still a good illustration of this dynamic of how how um, how income and wealth distribution has developed. The fortunes of the richest one to ten percent of individuals have skyrocketed. We see levels of income and wealth inequality within and also between countries despite growth. So that is why anthropologists would say that sustainable development goals are not a matter of financing development, but of distribution. It shouldn't be a matter of right, it should be a matter of rights and, and not of means in a way. Um, that is why an anthropological starting point to think around sustainable development goals would start more with a question like this. You can see here, um, what institutionalized obligations of distribution and assistance do people develop to distribute? And what is their scope, reach and reliability? How does it change um, at different times and why? And, and how do we justify um, specific inequalities and levels of, of distribution and sharing? Taxation is, um, at least in, in theory, an important institutionalized obligations of distribution in many countries. They formalize obligations between states and citizens and towards each other. However, anthropologists of tax would argue in practice, and also you know, my neighboring disciplines would say that um, in practice, that is much more complicated than what Santia um, already just mentioned, already hints, hints at, at, um, at these issues. I just want to share you know, some thoughts of what, what, what my colleagues, you know, they would argue. Um, anthropologists, for example, working on taxation in, in West African, but also in, in South American countries, they would emphasize that public goods, such as welfare and infrastructure, are not exclusively produced by the state, but how informal fees or tithes or community le levies or even bribes are used in these settings to finance public goods. And this is important work, I think, because it emphasizes that informal tax payments exceed formal tax payments in these countries and that they're often unrecognized. And Kate Marcher, for example, um, speaks, she's a development um, scholar, not an anthropologist, but works ethnographically. So, so she, she speaks, therefore, of fiscal essentialism to make the point that a focus on formal taxes obscures acknowledgement of uh, poor people's contribution to the funding of public goods and the interdependence of formal and informal economy. The work of Miranda Shield Johansen, a colleague of mine, she shows further that 
the widespread idea in, in social scientific thinking around like, taxation and, and that taxation is a formal social contract which defines our obligations to each other and defines what inequality as society, society wants to address and which one other institutions are responsible for it, for example, whatever family or religious uh, bodies, and um, doesn't work in countries such as Bolivia, where she uh, worked, um, where there isn't a clear we. I mean, there's never a clear we, but where nation building processes have a deep and, and painful entanglement with colonialism, with racism, and systematic violence and, and neglect. So she shows how specific groups of Bolivian taxpayers associate taxation um, with extortion. Um, they don't buy into the argument that building a national tax culture is good for everyone, something the Morales government tried to tell them over the last uh, years. Too deep is their experience of a state which never cared about them at all. Too deep is their experience that some people will have the power to opt out of such tax demands, um, whereas they would not be able to do so due to their lack of negotiating power or their lack of yeah, taxpayer rights. So a first insight from, from an anthropology of taxation is that decentering taxation from the state is highly relevant for debates around um, domestic resource mobilization because it foregrounds some of the tension which arise and will arise in, in such processes. However, my next point is that it is equally important to bring the state back into um, the debate because institutionalized obligations of distribution and redistribution of assistance and the scope, reach, and reliability of them are not self-evident. With whom we share what and when and for what reasons is socially negotiated. It's a learned practice that is contingent on the systems through societies order their relations to specific resources and objects of value, and obviously on the existing institutions of distribution and welfare. So while I agree with my colleagues that it's important to highlight the history of taxation in, in, in all countries, but specifically in countries with such a um, recent violent relation to taxation, um, my work emphasizes that it doesn't mean it cannot be different. What tax law is and does changes and is always a socially negotiated process. Um, tax laws have, um, I would say, the potential for structural changes. I think that's why we're also you know, here in this panel. They can act as a level of mechanisms. Different ideals are, however, obviously connected with tax policies at different times. Personal income and corporate income taxes, tax cuts, they have become since the 1980s a frequent political issue motivate, motivated by the imperative to provide a competitive economic and fiscal environment. You know, other specific ideas of what is good for the public, what is the public interest are, um, you know, we're entangled with the idea of a competitive economic and fiscal environment. So the consensus to moderate and reverse economic inequality through tax policy and other government intervention that had developed after the Second World War in specific advanced economies um, has in many of these economy, economies evaporated over the last four decades. Taxation is, for instance, for parts, for parts of the French society and right now a symbol of injustice as the work of fiscal sociologist Alex Speer shows when I mean, he was following the various tax protests in the Yellow West, uh, West movement. I, I'm not sure whether you are familiar with this movement in France, um, but many people have you know, went onto the street to demonstrate against the increase of taxes for fuels, which Manuel Macron wanted to introduce to also fund um, you know, a new way of the pension fund, I think it was. So, so here, I mean, he followed these debates in, in France, but also in Greece, in Spain. Um, and here, there's, there's nothing about, the, in, in, within these groups of society, taxes become a symbol of injustice. Thomas Piketty's work again, however, is also a good reminder that, there, that progressive tax rates were used in France in the beginning of the 20th century to rise revenue and undo rapidly rising 
inequality levels that the country experienced towards the end of the 19th century during the Belle Epoque years, a time where, and I quote him, there seemed to be no limit to the concentration of fortunes and private wealth could accumulate with hardly any tax restrictions. So Piketty's work also highlights the, the use of time limited special taxes to deal with large public debt crisis. Germany and Japan, for instance, imposed massive wealth taxes after World War II, and in this way reduced um, their public debt without austerity measures or transferring the debt to future generations. New discussions about tax as a productive force within economies appear, however, to be re-emerging amongst um, economists and politicians and also policymakers. There's a, there is a renewed interest in wealth taxes and wealth transfer taxes. There's a debate around the global minimum tax rate of 15% for corporations. There are suggestions of time-limited special taxes. In August 2020, for instance, the chief economic advisor of the Swiss COVID-19 task force suggested introducing a five-year tax on profits for companies that the task force proposal refers to as corona um, winners or COVID winners to deal with the accumulated public debts due to coronavirus emergency measures. So taking a historicizing perspective on tax law doesn't make these new pro proposals feel outrageous anymore as their critics often um, suggest they are. It makes us aware that what is a legitimate demand is and, and when it comes to distribution and what isn't and who decides that what is outrageous and what, what isn't is, is, is a relative and, and contextual question. The, I, yeah, so I'm coming to my last point. Um, I focused so far on examples from domestic tax systems. The same relational approach to taxes can also apply when we look um, at taxing relations beyond the state. And I think that's very important also for the debate. Um, current demands for more tax justice and fairness, fairness um, you know, popping up in, in various contexts and in countries around the world, it can be seen as, an, as a general articulation of the disconnect between moral expectations, what tax law is and, and should do, and what tax norms, domestic and international, do within a globalized and increase, increasingly digitalized economy. While today the power to tax is closely linked to um, exercising sovereignty, fiscal boundaries are often assumed to be co coeval with the territorial and legal boundaries of the nation state. When income and money and goods and services cross borders, it becomes less clear who, or who has or should have the power to tax and with what justifications. And my own work focuses on the making of international tax norms at the OECD in Paris. And here it becomes very tangible that what tax law is and does is a negotiated process when you, you know, watch these negotiators arguing about um, what factors should be taken into, into consideration or what loops should be closed in, in what ways. Um, and I just want to give you one example I focus on in the book I'm currently writing um, about these processes. The one chapter focuses on intellectual property rights. They play a crucial role um, as you know, how profits of multinational companies can be shifted to low tax jurisdictions, intellectual property rights themselves are, are, however, highly contested in today's global and digital economy. They provide companies with a competitive advantage, which makes it difficult for other companies, um, but also countries to catch up and compete. So, you know, they, they accelerate industry concentration. Um, they are also increasingly entangled with finance, which makes the promise that they bring innovation and growth even less clear because here investment logics and not public interest logics apply. So this is the idea that there's a balance between public interest and, and private interests becomes very, you know, very difficult to you know, pin down. They're also, highly they're, they're also highly contested because they reinforce hierarchical ideas of how and 
and where innovation and value creation takes place in global value chains and here by the effect and how profits are split between different jurisdictions. It is, for example, very contested that innovation doesn't appear also in places where contract research and development takes place or where manufacturing takes place. Like the idea that, that, that there is one office where all the R&D takes place and this is where the, the intellectual property holder resides um, yeah, is very much contested. So to sum up, can taxation play a significant role in achieving many of the sustainable de development goals? Um, I emphasize that it is important in this debate to not postpone with a focus on financing the moment of distribution to another time in the future, because the perfect moment where means are there to distribute might never arrive. And an anthropological perspective on tax, in my view, does three things. It decenters the tax from the state in order to emphasize that public goods such as welfare and infrastructure are not exclusively produced by the state in development countries. Um, I then also brought the state back into the debate to emphasize that taxation can act as a level on mechanisms. I highlighted that it depends also on what values are infused into policies and what, you know, what economic um, theories and, and ideologies go into policies and what exit options people have when forced to pay taxes. One shouldn't give taxes up too quickly as something unfeasible, even in settings which have a painful history with taxation state and nation building um, and a history which isn't even acknowledged yet by you know, many international and domestic actors. Lastly, I emphasize that um, one needs to move also outside of domestic fiscal spaces and look at the relation between different states and how other norms such as property norms need to be taken into consideration when we talk about how taxation can play a significant role in achieving many of the sustainable development goals. In other words, I wanted to highlight the interdependency and overlapment of different fiscal spaces and also the entanglement of tax with other key distributional norms such as property. Yeah, I come to the end and I'm looking forward to our yeah, to the rest of the panel and the discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Joanna. I speak, I believe, on behalf of everybody, if I can just say how much we enjoyed um, your presentation. It was really most interesting. And I think it really very clearly demonstrates the value of, of a multidisciplinary approach to a complex topic like taxation, understanding you know, the importance of informal taxation, history, individual human behavior, um, you know, context. Thank you so much, Joanna. I think we will have um, a next presentation next, and then we're looking forward to a debate and a discussion amongst the panelists about these interesting topics that you've raised. Thank you, Joanna. Adet, so over to you if you're ready. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, as you can see on the slides, my presentation will focus on taxation as a means of achieving the sustainable development goals in Africa. And obviously this will reach out to other developing countries. I'll now start with a few introductory remarks. States need funds to fulfill their main objective, even as the first panel said, and that objective is to ensure the welfare of citizens by providing public goods and services, financing the labor force and promoting economic development. So I was saying that state needs funds to fulfill their main objective, which is to ensure the welfare of citizens by providing public goods and, uh, and services and financing the labor force and also promoting economic development. Obviously, through these funds, states can ensure the protection of the universal human rights, such as the rights to life, liberty and security, the right to work, the right to a standard of living, which includes food, clothing, housing and medical care, and also necessary uh, social services. 
So taxes are considered the most sustainable way of financing economic development. However, the ability of African countries to generate funds through taxes has not been easy due to various internal and external factors. The internal factors are a direct result of poor governance systems evidenced by poor public investments and corruption. In addition, there are poor legal and administrative systems evidenced by underdeveloped laws, low enforcement of tax laws, and low administrative capacity, which impacts on effective tax collection. Addressing these internal challenges in Africa is perhaps the low lying fruit in realizing revenue gains much quickly. The external factors include inappropriate and uh, uh, externally imposed economic and fiscal policies that have failed to transform African countries, causing systematic challenges which require major shifts in fiscal policies before meaningful impact on revenue can be witnessed. African tax systems have historically been influenced by outside actors such as colonial interests and interests of foreign aid donors, as well as institutions such as the World Bank, the IMF, uh, uh, and uh, um, yes, such uh, institutions. Nevertheless, African countries view taxation as central to their structured transformation as it can address social and economic challenges such as poverty, inequality, low employment levels, which are the focus of the UN Sustainable Development Goal. So the background to the Sustainable Development Goals is that they evolved back from 2000, when the UN issued the Millennium Development Goals to achieve sustainable, equitable growth and poverty reduction. These were subsequently changed to the sustainable development goals that we agreed upon at the UN summit in September 2015 and adopted as part of the UN's 2030 Agenda for Development. The sustainable goals comprise 17 interconnected goals that address global challenges related to human development to achieve a better, more sustainable future for everyone. These include poverty, hunger, health, education, gender inequality, climate change, environmental degradation, prosperity, fair labor, peace, as well as the development of institutions and partnerships necessary to see real progress in these areas. In 2017, the UN developed a review mechanism for the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which entails a framework of indicators and statistical data to monitor progress, inform policy, and ensure accountability of all stakeholders. In May 2019, the UN issued a Sustainable Development Goals report, which reviewed progress after four years of implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Let's move to the next slide, please. Achieving these goals is of ultimate importance to every state. African leaders have come to realize that external sources like foreign aid will not be sufficient to meet sustainable development goals and to sustain progress beyond the 2030 target date. This is articulated in the African Union Agenda 2063 and was affirmed in the Common African Position on the post-2015 Development Agenda and the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, in which African countries place domestic revenue mobilization at the center of establishing an enabling framework to ensure the successful achievement of the sustainable development goals. In South Africa, the National Development Plan Vision for 2030, which was issued in, two, in 2011, guides the implementation of the sustainable development goals as it sets the country's overall economic policy, uh, strategy and policy to eliminate poverty and reduce inequality by 2030. You'll be pleased to know that the University of Pretoria, in conjunction with the Department of Science and Technology, 
hosts a sustainable development goals hub, which is housed at the Albert Lituri Center for Responsible Leadership in the Department of Business Management. This hub is a member of the UN Sustainable Solutions Network. Now we have to consider the role of taxes in achieving sustainable development goals. And this was highlighted in the first global conference on taxation and sustainable development, which was organized by the, by the platform for collaboration on tax in 2018. And I'm going to consider some of those factors. Next slide, please. Taxes generate funds to support the achieving of the sustainable development goals. They play a fundamental role in raising resources for government to deliver essential public services. Research indicates that at least 15% of GDP in revenue is necessary to finance these sustainable development goals. But in almost 30 of the 75 poorest countries, many of which are in Africa, tax revenues are below this 15% threshold. Developing countries require a large amount of revenues to fund resources for ending poverty, that is SDG 1, as you see on the slide, hunger and malnutrition, SDG 2, to ensure quality education, good health and well being, clean water and sanitation, clean and affordable energy, infrastructure, reduced inequalities and strong institutions. Taxation is also key to promote economic growth and uh, equitable distribution of public resources. It's also important in relation to gender equality, that is SDG 5, decent work and economic growth, as well as sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, and the partnerships for the achievement of these goals. Next slide, please. Taxation can also ensure equity, which is instrumental in achieving the sustainable development goals. Tax equity entails developing tax laws that are fair and impartial, imposing equal tax burden on taxpayers with equal income, and by making those burdens commensurate with the ability of the taxpayers to pay. This is in line with SDG 10 on reducing inequalities. Equity is impacted on when some taxpayers get involved in tax evasion and tax avoidance practices. Tax evasion as a result of illicit financial flows is considered the single most impactful stumbling block to sustain it to domestic revenue mobilization in Africa and is estimated between $50 billion and $80 billion per annum. And in some cases, the revenue lost exceeds the level of aid received by developing countries. Addressing illicit financial flows by high net worth individuals requires great cooperation and exchange of information by the international community. And this is in line with SDG 17, which deals with partnerships for development. Um, the impact obviously of tax evasion on sustainable development has been evidenced by the various data leaks that we are referred to in the first panel. Um, for example, the 2016 Panama Papers, the 2017 Paradise Papers, and now most recently last week through this week, we are dealing with the Paradise Papers which are exposing millions of financial documents of wealthy individuals and state leaders, including those in Africa, who hide their riches in secret tax haven jurisdictions. And the resultant tax evasion and avoidance accounts for a big fraction of revenue loss in developing countries, which would have been essential in ensuring that we have revenue recovery after uh, uh, the COVID-19 financial crisis. International equity is further impacted on when we have multinationals that engage in base erosion and profit shifting so that they do not pay their fair share of taxes in the countries they transact in. In 2015, the OECD issued its BEPS uh, uh, finalized and came up with 15 uh, action measures to address BEPS, which if adopted 
have the potential of ensuring African countries can protect their tax bases and get their fair share of taxes for multinationals that are investing within their borders. International co cooperation is once again essential to, to resolving these challenges. Uh, the international community has since what been working together to ensure that they come up with new rules that will ensure equitable taxation of the digital economy and a statement on the agreed proposals to tax the digital economy was issued on 1 July 2021 and hopefully uh, the OECD thinks that uh, final uh, rules may be crafted actually by the end of this October. Next slide, please. All right. Taxes also influence people's behaviors and choices, which has got implications for the environment and health outcomes which impact on sustainable development. Taxes can impact on environmental protection. Many countries are seeking a more environmentally friendly and sustainable approach to economic development. And this can be instrumental for attaining clean water and sanitation, that is SDG 6, affordable clean energy, that is SDG 7, sustainable industrialization, that is 9, safe, resilient, and sustainable communities, which is 11, sustainable in industrialization, safe, resilient, and uh, sustainable communities, sustainable production and consumption, combating climate change, sustainable use of oceans, seas, and maritime resources, and the sustainable use of land, forest, and uh, territorial eco ecosystems, as well as strengthening partnership for sustainable uh, development. Green taxes, such as excess taxes on carbon dioxide emissions, are being used as a tool to curtail the pollution of the environment. South Africa, for example, levies carbon tax on petrol and diesel. Some countries also levy tax on plastic bags, which have become an environmental hazard. Rwanda is an example that has emerged to deal with the plastics issue. Rwanda is an, uh, as a plastic, with uh, the plastics issues and its capital city, Kigali, is, rest, is rated the greenest and cleanest city in Africa. The government prohibits the manufacture, importation, use, and sale of single-use plastic items in Rwanda. Let's move to the next slide, please. Excess taxes have also been used as a tool in public health issues to achieve SDG3, which deals with ensuring health lives and promoting well-being for all. Tobacco taxation is a powerful tool for reducing the public health burden of smoking, of smoking related diseases. For example, South Africa levies the so-called sin taxes on cigarettes, cigars, tobacco, and alcohol. Likewise, some countries levy a sugar tax to deal with obesity issues. Next slide, please. Taxes can also be used as a tool to achieve gender equality as indicated in SDG 5 and SDG 10. Gender equality and women empowerment is a developmental goal in its own right. However, tax laws can have implicit and explicit gender biases that discriminate on some genders. Explicit gender biases result from specific provisions of the laws that deliberately treat men and women differently. Implicit biases are less obvious but can be felt in the way the tax system operates. For example, indirect taxes such as VAT can have implicit gender biases because economically, women and men tend to have different consumption patterns. Women in developing countries tend to purchase more goods and services that promote health, education, and nutrition compared to men. This creates the potential for women to bear a larger VAT button if, if VAT systems do not provide for exemptions, reduced rates, or zero rating. It is therefore important that the legislators of developing countries, and obviously other countries at large, consider the gender dimensions of taxation. Let's move to the next slide, please. 
Now, the successful achievement of the sustainable development goals requires efficient and, e and effective tax systems. Effective tax administration is built on a foundation of voluntary compliance, effective enforcement, and a high reliance on third party reporting by employers and financial institutions to reduce the opportunities for tax evasion. This is in line with SDG 11, which promotes inclusive and sustainable communities, and SDG 16, which requires effective, effective and accountable, as well as inclusive institutions. It is important, therefore, for tax administrators to be competent and they must be perceived to be fair to taxpayers. Equitable tax administration promotes public trust in the tax system, which enhances revenue collection. Citizens ought to see a connection between the taxes they pay and the public services that they receive in return. This requires government ac accountability and transparency on how tax revenues are spent. The lack of political will to insulate administrations from political incursions also impacts on revenue collections. The need for effective tax administration is especially acute in fragile states in Africa, such as those in post-conflict situations and those ravaged by war and natural disasters. Since economic development cannot be attained without revenue, fragile states are often the farthest from achieving the sustainable development goals, especially those that relate to education, health, nutrition. And so it's important that we have some research going on on how these fragile states can urgently build self-sustaining tax systems. Next slide, please. And that will be the last one as I conclude. Over the last few years, there have been tax reforms in various African countries, which range from overhauling outdated tax administrations, simplifying tax codes, adopting cooperative tax compliance programs to promote better tax compliance, improving public finance management, and strengthening tax administration capacity. Consequently, Sub-Saharan Sub Africa has shown encouraging trends in domestic revenue mobilization over the past decade, which has constituted an average of about 70% of development finance with a deficit of 30% that is usually filled by loans or other forms of public finance. Despite these reforms, economic growth levels have not been proportionately matched by raising tax revenues. Domestic revenue mobilization to fund Africa's development still re remains unstable and unreliable. And this has been made worse by the COVID-19 pandemic with many African countries and developing countries at large now heavily indebted as they had to borrow large sums of money to fight the pandemic. Well, as African countries make more effort to achieve the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals and the 2063 African Union Agenda, the impediments to domestic revenue mobilization need to be continuously re-examined, especially with the current uh, dynamics we face in uh, the era of COVID-19. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Annette. For, for such a concise and such a solid exposition of the fundamental role that taxation has in development and with the emphasis on Africa and specifically, of course, the relief of poverty in all of its different dimensions as they are reflected in the, the 17 SDGs. Particularly interesting, of course, is the um, what you've emphasized the pervasive and deleterious impact of financial um, illicit financial flows as as Asha has also mentioned in the previous panel that remains very concerning particularly in the face of course um, of the, the continued and persistent difficulty that these countries have in with domestic revenue mobilization so thank you very much for that Annette um, Art, I think we are ready to proceed with, with your presentation. If that's good for you, then thank you so much.
Thank you so much, uh, Sansia. Um, I will start uh, by revisiting the standard arguments for strengthening tax systems in relation to the sustainable development goals. The three main arguments. So it's of course, firstly, uh, tax uh, raising revenue. It is about raising revenue to finance governmental expenditures. But it is more than that. It is related to that taxation may also support increased spending in social sectors like health and education. And third, uh, taxation can be a catalyst for improved governance and state building. And just to revisit those arguments behind the links between uh, taxation and state building, this is it's quite intuitive set of arguments, but very oversimplified. First, governments, they have a stronger or stronger incentives to promote economic growth when they are dependent on taxes and therefore on the prosperity of taxpayers. So there's a mutual interest in principle here between the government and, and, and citizens or taxpayers in this respect. In principle, I say, practice may differ substantially. The second argument is that dependency or taxes requires states to develop a bureaucratic uh, apparatus for tax collection. And that uh, development of an effective tax administration may also contribute to general improvements in the, in the public administration, for instance, through uh, digitalization, etc. And the third argument is that fiscal bargaining and negotiation between the state and citizens, our taxes is central to the development of a social fiscal contract. Again, oversimplified, and as Sansia also mentioned in her introduction, uh, the social fiscal contract or the fiscal social contract in general seems to be under threat in many, many, many countries. But now let me now go through each of these arguments uh, or points uh, um, in sequence. First, raising revenue to finance governmental expenditure. Well. Development aid is not enough to fill the finance gap and the scale of sust uh, sustainable development ambitions. One cannot, developing countries and particular countries in Sub-Saharan Africa cannot rely on foreign aid. The 0.7% uh, uh, official development assistance to GDP target has been agreed by the OECD DAC members since the 1970s, but only four of the 29 OECD DAC member countries now contribute above this target. It's the Scandinavian countries, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and uh, then Luxembourg. So greater domestic resource mobilization is seen as a way to reduce the gap between the ambitions of the SDGs and available development finance. And African governments in general of course, there are exceptions, in particular the fragile states and the states in conflict. But in general, have African governments become very focused on the revenues they collect themselves. And today, taxation is the major revenue source for many African countries. Actually, by 2014, the average tax revenues in Africa were more than double the average aid revenues in percent of G GDP. The fragile and conflict-ridden states in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa is a different picture. And here, this graph shows that um, actually in 1996, the, uh, the uh, tax to GDP ratio was the same as the aid, aid to GDP ratio in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. In 2014, tax to GDP contributed twice as much revenues to, on average to African countries than aid. So it's important to, to, to notify that actually ta taxation is, the, is a major revenue source for the majority of sub-Saharan African countries. And it is also worth mentioning that compared to some other regions in the world, for instance, South Asia with Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and Pakistan, for instance, and the Middle East, Africa is actually doing relatively well when it comes to tax collection. The second 
point. Uh, increased taxation may support increased spending in social sectors. Well, of course, taxation is of little use. Uh, the, the key issue is that the impact of taxation depends on how revenues are allocated and used. And there are a number of studies which find positive correlation between tax revenues from non-resource sector, that means uh, sectors which are not from the uh, natural resources, they actually spend more on health, education and social protection. And a study from, uh, from uh, USAID uh, 2016 estimates that a 10% increase in the non-resource taxes leads to a 17% increase in health expenditure in low-income countries. And the social sectors also tend to be benefit more from additional taxation than sectors like defense and agriculture. Revenues from natural resources minerals, oil, gas, do not have this effect on the composition of public goods and services. Uh, here are some graphs illustrating this. These are from the World Development Indicators, and it just show the correlation between tax to GDP from non-resource sources and spending on health, education, and social protection. All positive correlation. We are not talking about causality here, but correlations. Third point, taxation can be a catalyst for improved governance and state building. Well, that depends on how taxes are implemented and who are actually paying the taxes. But if taxation is undertaken in a way that promotes greater responsiveness and accountability alongside improvements in the state's institutional capacity, then tax reform can become a catalyst for broader improvements in government performance. And uh, here are some studies uh, using different indicators here, uh, which finds that there are positive correlations between tax in percentage of GDP and control of corruption, voice and accountability, government effectiveness, political stability. These are global figures. And a number of studies also find that bad governance are also linked often to uh, to non to to to, to um, governments which are not dependent on tax taxing their citizens. It is bad governance is often correlated with limited state reliance on revenues from taxation of its citizens and business, and non revenues in particular oil and minerals they tend to leave regimes freer to make whatever expenditures they wish without they're having to be concerned about the likely reactions of citizens. And rentier states, they have limited incentives to build up institutions to collect and administer tax or to extend the reach of the government to poorer, more remote regions. I worked a lot in Angola, highly dependent on oil, oil revenues. And this Angola fits very well into this picture. Another example is, uh, is uh, Ang Nigeria, uh, Equatorial Guinea, there are a number of countries which fit into this bad governance pattern, the, where the revenues mainly comes from natural resource extraction. And uh, policymakers, they have also less incentives in these settings to, to generate revenue from other sources, particularly if they expect to be held more accountable. And that is also what some of my work with colleagues from the Catholic University in Luanda, Angola has shown that the ordinary tax system was, seems to be uh, actually uh, by purpose hold down because the, the, the regime under the Santos, he, the former president was so dependent on oil and could sustain their power in that respect. And there are less incentives uh, to uh, generate for policymakers to generate revenue from other sources, as mentioned. There are only, to my knowledge, there are only three countries which generate huge revenues from natural resources, which have managed to, to uh, uh, use those revenues for the purpose, the development purpose, and develop their in institutions. Uh, democratic institutions, and so on. That is uh, 
Botswana in Africa, Malaysia in Asia, and Norway, where I come from. Then that is the, the broad generic picture. Um, the post the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has had huge impacts on the tax regimes, on, on state citizen relations in most countries, and particularly so in the poor African countries. Uh, for poor countries which already face significant underfunding on, on their SDGs, the pandemic has both increased the need for more revenue and made its domestic resource mobilization more difficult. I'll come back to that. Tax to GDP ratios in many sub-Saharan African countries are below 15%, which is a ratio which frequently have been mentioned as a minimum requirement for reaching the SDGs. Some countries like Somalia has a, a, a tax to GDP ratio around 2%, Uganda 12%, Tanzania 13%, so, so there's a big challenge already before the pandemic that countries were not able to mob, would not be able to reach their, uh, their SDGs through own sources. The IMF in uh, 2019, but also in earlier studies, uh, argued that increasing the tax to GDP ratio by five percentage points by 2030 is a reasonable aspiration for poor countries. I disagree severely. Collect, I agree that collecting more revenues is possible, but IMF's position was unrealistic before the pandemic and even more so. If you look at the revenue trends uh, based on data from, the, uh, from, uh, from governing, governments across Africa, we see that uh, the, the annual uh, revenue to GDP growth uh, in many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, increased by a modest 0.1 to 0.2% of the period 20, 1987 to 2018. So over the coming 10 year period from now, uh, if they manage 0.1 to 0.2% per year, then they would increase the, the tax to GDP ratios of maybe with one to 2%. So for Tanzania, it would imply it will still be below 15%. For Somalia, maybe 3% if there are not dramatic changes. So more realistic projections are, are required to when one is also planning for how to finance the SDGs. Uh, in my view, future increases in revenues will require gradual improvements in taxing a range of sources. Um, uh, Annette mentioned excises, which is important in some countries. There is also a need for fewer tax exemptions and subsidies, and corruption is still a big challenge, which should be also addressed in many countries. But there, is no, there are no big bang solutions. And when it comes to redistribution to the domestic tax system, it is it is quite unrealistic in poor countries with revenue to GDP ratios below 15%. Um, and if you look at the tax system in many African countries, they are actually quite progressive. South Africa was mentioned by uh, Sansia in her in introduction, but this also applies to many of the low income countries, poorer countries. In, in Tanzania and Uganda, about 500 companies comp contribute to 70-80% of, uh, of the total tax revenues. In Senegal, we are talking about 17 companies contributing to around 70%. So the tax system is already quite progressive. And second, there are no strong organized political support for such redistribution through the tax system in many sub saharan sub-Saharan African countries. The political drive for increased revenues is often specific and very often uh, it's argued that one should target uh, uh, companies in the extractive sectors and multinational companies, while the push to tax ordinary citizens and the rich is politically sensitive rather than 
it's rather diffuse and weakened by tax exemptions. One exception is South Africa, where there is a, a lot of discussion now about taxing the rich, taxing the elites and so on, but that is actually one exception. And South Africa has a tax to GDP rate to around 25% or less 24% now after the pandemic. Uh, so it has a much higher tax to GDP rate than the average uh, Sub-Saharan African country. And there is a much more vibrant political, uh, uh, so, um, uh, much more vi vibrant uh, uh, civil society uh, uh, environment and also, uh, also media that can hold the government accountable. But I think South Africa, the drive there is also quite challenging that they are now pushing for more taxes in a situ situation which actually uh, the tax system, current tax system is quite progressive. And the, wealth, the rich, they have already all kinds of means to avoid taxes through offshore financial centers. So the barrier to broader public engagement for domestic resource revenue mobility remain substantial in many countries. Uh, and there is also limited trust in governments and tax authorities, especially in the fragile states, but also in many other countries, which undermines the potential for constructive tax campaigning. And a more aggressive revenue mobilization is likely to negatively affect many taxpayers who are struggling to survive. Uh, that is something I'm quite worried with the development in South Africa, where the South African revenue service has actually been uh, expressed that we will be now it's ag aggressive tax uh, enforcement will be the new approach. And this could further undermine the legitimacy of the tax system, as well as citizens trust in the tax administration and the government in general, actually. So what then accounts for the increasing tax to GDP ratio over time? Well, part of the answer lies in the increased prof professionalism, motivation and modernization of African tax administration and a more constructive uh, relationship between the tax administration and taxpayers and taxpayer associations. Because what are the risks of targeting more taxes? Well, too much tax can impede private investment Taxation can be predatory and divisive. And the benefits of more taxes depend, of course, on how the money is used. I think this general rule applies both to uh, now, uh, both now as it did before the pandemic. The overall challenge is not only to tax more, but to tax better, more consistent, transparent, fair, predictable, efficient, and honest. So what are the scenarios or possible scenarios for African countries when it comes to domestic resource mobilization as a measure to uh, achieve the sustainable development goals? There are many scenarios. I, I, I've just uh, suggested two here. Uh, firstly, will the urgency of increased domestic uh, resource mobilization brought about by the pandemic motivate governments to push for more coercive collection methods to reach the revenue targets with the costs that may have on, uh, on the legitimacy of the tax system, trust in government, and so on? Or will instead the pandemic motivate ruling elites to interact more constructively with taxpayers and establish a dialogue based on mutual understanding of the challenges? Uh, it remains to be seen which scenario is most realistic and probably there will be huge differences between African, uh, how African countries uh, uh, approach the new, uh, uh, new, new setting here with major challenge in raising revenues and where a uh, substantial share of the re traditional revenue base has, is in big trouble. So with those words, I will say thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Odd, for an excellent presentation, sharing with us the wealth of insights and experience of, of your many years of work in taxation and development and 
I must say the real or the realism that your that your practical experience working in the sub-Saharan African countries brings is is invaluable if if somewhat sobering, particularly in this recovery phase of the of the pandemic. I think what we will do next is I would like to invite our panelists to to engage. I think they might like to to discuss some of the topics that they've addressed in their presentations with each other. Um, Art, can, can I give the floor to you? Are you happy to? Yeah, yeah, that's that's fine. Um, I, I find the, both presentations, Annette's and, uh, and Johanna's very exciting and they were very different. Well, while, uh, while um, Johanna focused to some extent on the informal taxes and the impacts of the informal tax system on the on the on the a broad range of citizens and often the poor um, and that had 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 a much had had a, had took uh, started with the uh, with the other end of the tax system the international thing how to tax multinational how to get in place a more fair international tax system and how what what approaches is in place uh, uh, partly or partly run operated by the OECD um, I have one question here to uh, to Johanna on the informal taxes yes it is now well documented well there are still a lot of research with more research required, but we know from West Africa, as you mentioned, Jana, uh, we know also from Somalia, recent work by uh, Vanessa van den Bogart, that informal taxes uh, can actually uh, consume a large part of the incomes of poor people. And they are used also to, to finance different types of, of uh, local, uh, very local services. But that may not be only the part of the story here, because we also know that uh, that uh, this type of informal taxes, if you can call it, includes also bribes to teach a uh, bribe to a nurse to get a clean sheet, cheat for a relative on uh, in a in a, in a clinic and so on. So 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 these informal. I have a, to some extent a problem to um, uh, with the concept, but let us let us use it. Uh, because there are both public and non-public actors involved there. But do you see a formalization of all these small micro enterprises as an approach, as a way of, is, is, is that, has that any potential to raise revenues? Or what will benefit these informal traders by formalizing, getting into the tax net? Or is it so that they actually try better where they are? And then a short question to Annette, uh, that is many of these processes to get to establish a more reasonable, fair international tax system is driven by the, the rich OECD country. It's there in their interest. Is this, is the way this mechanism are driven also in the interest of Africa? How, how are African countries or African tax administration or governments involved in these international processes? Can I go first? Please, yes, yeah. thank you so much. Okay, yeah, thank you also to Annette and Odd for your presentations. I really, really enjoy them and I learned so much. Um, yeah, thank you. And with regards to Odd's question, I, I, first of all, I totally agree with you that um, anthropologists of taxations are too freely with the concepts of tax. They, they call everything a tax, um, whether it is paid to, to the revenue authorities or their internal revenue services or to a school or to a church. And um, I think that is, that is true that then by, by, by doing that, then you, you risk you risk, uh, you know, grasping what what is a state tax being paid to the stacks, and what does it what, what does it do to like larger distributional um, um, and pots in a way. So that's something I would totally agree with. And when the, with regards to the second point, I just want to add when you mentioned taxes are also paid as bribes. I mean, here I think I would disagree. I mean. With, with my research on, this was before I was focusing on tax, I was working on 
on uh, South African, actually the National Prosecuting Authority and, and accountability issues here. And so I was you know, very much looking also as, at Southern African um, legal institutions and their funding. And there's a fascinating study by Thomas Bierschein from Germany, who was doing a lot of research in Benin. And he was he was he wasn't calling the payments uh, people did to prosecutors necessarily a bribe, but he was showing that these prosecution offices are so badly funded that without these payments they couldn't even do their job. So, so I think here I would that's why why as from an anthropological perspective you are you can call these these payments um, you know they 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 are. They are they are sustaining the, the state in these settings. That, that's one thing. So then to, towards your last question about if you formalize them, um, I think, I mean, it's, it's very different in, in different settings. And I'm mostly familiar with, uh, with Miranda's research in Bolivia because we're, we're editing right now a book about the anthropology of taxation. And my work focuses on policy making. So I'm actually far away from I'm more looking at how what countries are involved in international tax policy making and what are the factors why specific norms uh, flourish and others don't. So, but what I know from their research is that that uh, that there is, I mean, in Bolivia, for example, people are there is no way that people would like to formalize their business that they don't buy and they would rather they would rather. Um, their future is they want to be independent of the state. They want to have maybe a separate, they want to be left alone. So there, there's no, while they still have maybe, I mean, I, I always press them these colleagues also to say, aren't there any hopes in the state? And, and, and so there are hopes in like larger distributive systems because these systems are not, I mean, they, they sound, they sound maybe that they can be reliable, but I mean, they're very, they are very uncertain and there's not, it's not that, that one has like a perfect infrastructure and a reliable social security network through these informal payments. I mean, this is, it, this is a different story, but I, in, in these contexts, I don't see any, um, any um, near future that this is very attractive to formalize the businesses. And especially for the reasons you mentioned also in your, your own research, I mean, in Bolivia, they, these small time traders, they could see that the mayor of the company, the mayor of the town would have would use the the, the official funds or the, the the money which is coming through um, revenues from I think I, I think it's the extractive industry in, in Bolivia how it is abused and squandered. So there was no there is no hope I think right now yeah at least. Thank you very much, Joanna. Um, Art, I don't know if you have something to add on the topic. Otherwise, we can perhaps move on to Annette's response to, to your question. I do see that even though we're not excessively time pressured, that the clock is running. <laughs> so perhaps we should move on to Annette and then we can always come back later if we have more time. Thank you, Annette. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, uh, the presentations, once again, from Joanna and Odd, we are quite very interesting. And Odd, thank you for the question you've asked about uh, African countries, if I understand it well. African countries and their involvement in international norm setting and whether their interests are actually taken into consideration in such norm setting bodies, such as the OECD. Obviously, the UN would be pro-developing countries like uh, like uh, those in Africa. Perhaps I'll take a step back in addressing this question and say that historically, the issue of fair allocation of taxing rights among developing and developing countries has been a thorny issue right from the development of, um, of, of model tax convention that uh, one of uh, the frameworks that drive the uh, international tax framework. But you find uh, that, uh, developing countries that have at least tried to push the boundaries uh, have been those from Latin America when the model tax convention were uh, uh, being developed. 
there wasn't obviously much involvement of African countries since they were still uh, within that uh, colonial bubble. And, but developing countries, especially uh, under the clout of the UN, have been pushing those boundaries and they have been uh, suffering when it comes to unfair allocation of taxing rights, both from the tax treaties that they have, uh, 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 they have signed and the fact that even there has been low uptake or development of tax laws that are, um, are solid enough in order to prevent the tax avoidance that has been going on. I think we've seen a change over the last few years, especially after the global financial crisis, when developed countries that were at the profiting end of these laws that they developed began to suffer after the global financial crisis. And they were actually put in the position of source countries that many developing countries had. And then they developed the political will to change the system altogether. And so a few years later, we see the OECD, the G20 coming together and calling for rules to prevent base erosion and profit shifting. And then we see the 20 15 ABEPS reports coming up that are intended to ensure that multinationals uh, pay the fair share of taxes in the countries they transact in, which African countries had been suffering from for a number of years. It was hoped that BEPS-1, as it's called, would be effective in ensuring a proper allocation of taxing rights, but it did fall short, and there's been a lot of criticism on that. So BEPS-2 comes into play, and here this one deals with the issues related to the taxation of the digital economy. While that was evolving, developing countries called on the OECD to create a more inclusive framework so that they can be involved in the norm setting of the new rules to tax the digital economy, considering that the international tax rules that we have now are not holding water since they were created in a paradigm where you needed to have physical, uh, you need to be physically present in a jurisdiction in order to be taxed or trade in physical goods and services. But now we have all these intangibles that are the main uh, uh, driving factor when it comes to development. So when you see in that regard, uh, previously you had the likes of countries like South Africa and Africa that had been called to be observers, for example, to the OEC, the development of the, in the OECD, but there wasn't much more involvement of many African countries. It's after BEPS too that you see the likes of African countries being involved and even African tax uh, uh, administrations under the species of ATAF, that is the African tax organization that have actually built up this cloud and one could say a force to be reckoned on that is building a united front from Africa. And obviously not all African countries are involved, but so many African countries have been pushing the boundaries and having their voice heard. The question is, are they being listened to? Is there anything that is being done to ensure that they are actually listened to? We all know that with respect to the discussion on the taxation of the digital economy, it has actually been a, a fight between the U.S. trying to make sure that its multinationals are not taxed as much as they should, and the EU or European countries trying to make sure they tax a lot more than they should. We have had the likes of Nigeria, playing a big role as being one of the co-chairs of the BEPS, uh, of, of, of the inclusive, in the inclusive framework that is dealing with the taxation of the digital economy. But as much as Nigeria and other African countries have involved, when the OECD, and I'm about to wrap up, I see uh, you're getting a bit jittery, uh, uh, Sansha, but when the OECD issued that statement with respect to its proposals for the new rules to taxing the digital economy. In Africa, Nigeria and Kenya are the only countries that came out broadly and said these new rules are not in our favor. And I think that is a very bold stance. 
We have had uh, the likes of ATAF coming up with technical reports and also putting their weight behind the fact that the new rules are not in the favor of developing countries. Then among the G24, they are among uh, African countries there that have also heard their voice and they're sending out all this commentary on the new rules, which are going to change the, the, the trajectory of taxation of uh, international tax, so to say, and the taxation of multinationals. So it's important that countries come out strongly and present their position on, on this. South Africa is towing the OECD line um, for various reasons, but I'm glad to hear that there are African countries that have stood out strongly. The challenge that arises though is uh, what ATAF has said. Many of them that may come up against this may face repercussions from strong countries, and that is a matter that ATAF has tried to, one, uh, 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 to flag and tell the OECD that these countries should not be penalized unnecessarily because being part of the inclusive framework is actually supposed to be voluntary. I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Yeah, I actually have a question. I know we're conscious of time, but jo Johanna, my recollection is that you did your some field work at OECD during some of these discussions. Is that not correct? And if it is, could you maybe tell us some of your observations, what you you saw in this? Um, yeah, I mean, I did I did field work um, from 2016 to 2018, 19 onwards. On on the, I mean, I started with the BEPS consultation meetings, and then I moved into observing the wider epistemic community of international tax um, experts and who who is involved in not only making these norms but also shaping the international um, tax debates. And what I what I was um, yeah I mean in my in my work I kind of um, look at the, the the structural privileges certain actors have in in being involved in the debate and I mean I I was also observing you know from when I started the research I was also you know fascinated how how what international means in that area and how the past dependencies of countries who were able with their own you know very sophisticated tax laws are able to shape these debates much better than countries which just don't have um, such a large body of you know very sophisticated um, tax law and I thought um, um, Annette it, it was it was I mean I, first, I also thought this is like very important that many countries are involved in it and, and, and can be voiced. But then at some point, I also thought that if you if you enlarge the body bodies of countries to to you know, come up with a decision, whether that's not only also maybe in postponement because there, it's a consensus based organization and you have more people on the table and nothing happens. Have you got have you got any like, thoughts on this? Like that, it's important that to be that, that, that it's that you are heard, but and that there are more people on the table. But on the other hand, if if this is also maybe a um, yeah, a problem of yeah, then not coming to a consensus at all, or one which is you know on a very low standard. I think the bottom line here, if I may respond to your question, Joanna, is that finally, if the rules are going to be crafted and they are forever going to impact on other countries' development agendas for decades online, then frankly, these countries must be hard. The system that we have right now was set up literally uh, uh, 100 years ago and developing countries have suffered the brunt of them for a whole hundred countries. They are now calling for change, I mean, Developed countries have benefited for these rules, from these rules, while these countries were developing and they didn't know their right from their left. Now they know what is at stake. Listen to them. And the thing is that obviously, if you have so many countries on the table, there should be a give and take and some kind of uh, flexibility. But what it happens right now is that there is more give than take, more, more, more give or, or takes whatever way we have to put it, that developing countries have to surrender as it was in the past. All they are calling for is more flexibility. Talk about, for example, the 15% rate that is set as a minimum tax rate. 
even before that rate was set, recommendations were sent by the G24. Please set it at 25. The eight have set up recommendations, but it is not being heard because it is being paid on certain profiting countries. 15% is a minimum or closer to what the likes of Ireland are setting. Ireland is set at 12.5, and it is also one of those that refuse to sign up because it has moved on a few of some of these measures that the OECD said and is not ready to reduce any more than that. But the thing is that many African countries, many developing countries have rates way above 20%. So creating a, a, a rate that is more acceptable. We can't have a situation that all multinationals evolve from the US and now the taxation rules are set up in such a way, or the, the rules for taxing the digital economy are set up in such a way that the only tax, literally only the top 100 multinationals, those are very big. If you consider the type that are investing in Africa, those rules won't impact on them. And so African countries, developing countries at large, won't be able actually to use those rules to tax multinationals transacting in here. We will still be stuck with the old rules and yet, they are still here. So those are major challenges. They're literally, they're asking for shifts to be made. You've benefited much long. Why can't you move to our aid a little bit? And based on that, actually, even how the rules are going to evolve going forward is a major challenge for developing countries, considering their capacity constraints, considering that the rules are actually set by the developing countries, Considering their context, if you look at the context of developed countries, they are all fairly the same in such a way they could move an inch towards making the things work. But the context of developing countries is not considered. Their capacity countries, the fact that actually many of them don't even have the basic rules that applied 100 years ago in order to preserve their tax bases. I'll end it at that. Thanks. Thank you very much, Annette. <laughs> I do notice that we have one question from Chloe <clears throat> in our chat box. Um, aren't taxes a relevant part of the fiscal contract portion of any social contract? Art, I do believe that you've answered that in, in your presentation. Would you perhaps like to just respond to that? Well, the, uh, the, 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 this, this is actually a very interesting question because uh, in much of the literature, it has been taken as granted that, okay, this, the fiscal contract is a part of the social contract. Uh, now there is a growing literature also expanding this issue about other types of, uh, uh, of contracts. The fiscal is one, legal is one, uh, property rights, and so on. So, uh, so I cannot come up with a kind of a, a oracle uh, of Delphi respond to this, because this is something we have now started to work more on. And there are uh, a, there is a small but growing literature. And I'm also working on these issues. Because my, most of my work has actually uh, focused on the social fiscal contract. But I realized that that is one component of the social contract between the state and citizens. If you um, you can have my, it would be very interesting to follow up these issues uh, with you if you are particularly interested in that, uh, because this is this is a really uh, exciting area of, of research now. Thank you very much for that, Odd. Um, I would like to invite our panelists if there is a final comment that anybody would like to make. Joanna, I don't know if you have something that you would like to add. Yes, since I have already <laughs> the world here uh, or the mic open, unmuted. So, um, well, I think it's 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 very important also to look at taxes, taxes and expenditure in connection, uh, because tax revenues doesn't make much sense if they are wasted on corruption or state capture, uh, the, uh, what we have seen in South Africa with, uh, with the, under the previous regime under SUMA. Hopefully now the Sondo Commission can expose this and those who were involved were also being uh, punished for it. Um, we know that, uh, that they really go for the big fish fishes, which really undermined not only 
the tax administration, but also the uh, the uh, many public institutions. The, the the fish rot rots from the head and down. You know, so that will be very exciting to follow. But in South Africa and many other. Uh, Con developing countries, the public enterprises are extremely often very ineffective and they are draining the budgets. So, for instance, in South Africa, we have the ESCOM and Transnet and other public, public agencies which are consuming huge amounts of the public budget. And this is something which taxpayers or citizens know. This contributes also to this waste contributes to undermine the legitimacy of the tax system, the trust in institutions, and it drains resources which could have been spent on health, education, in building of more stronger institutions. So looking at tax or an expenditure uh, in, in connection, I think that's important. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I couldn't agree more. So I think in, in the South African context, Perhaps the single most important concept that we're struggling to get right at this stage is accountability. Um, of course, all of these things that you mentioned are true and on an astounding scale, I think even knowing about it, we still remain surprised frequently when another aspect, another dimension, something new, you know, becomes exposed. And so these, these things are known and I think even the culprits are known <laughs> and we're still struggling to enforce accountability. And I'm not sure exactly why that happens. I actually thought if time allowed, I would have liked to, to speak to Johanna about that. I, I've read some of your previous research about the, you know, the um, quantitative um, indicators that one could use to, to, to just try and make accountability more transparent, more measurable and, and so on. Um, I guess, given time, we would have to leave that for, for another day. Um, Joanna, I would like to perhaps just give you an opportunity if you'd like to make a closing comment. Um, yes, I just want to emphasize again that I'm like really inspired by the discussion and also by the two research papers and the, the, the thing where I would have preferred to carry on talking about is what where odd ended um, about in which direction tax authorities will um, venture to whether they will be more cooperative or more aggressive and and I was stuck with the word you know the aggressiveness and which also relates to our question of taxpayer rights like um, if, if tax authorities become more aggressive in in collecting revenue then I, I, my interest would be then also to, in which direction are they focusing on I mean the the, the research also colleagues of mine are doing they see aggressive resource mobilization, for example, in, in, in Croatia, Robin Smith is doing research and here it is again, like small medium enterprises which are targeted, but not the larger companies. They can, can opt out. So this question of opting out of, of fiscal obligations is you know, still very much, yeah, will be with us, unfortunately, and will become more urgent as we, as we go um, along with trying to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. So I, I want to thank the organizers and you also, Santia, for the chairing and, and Nina for the invitation. And I hope this won't be the last time we discussing these issues. Well, thank you very much for that, Joanna, and to our other outstanding panelists, Odd and Annette. What a privilege to have this expertise and experience um, and to, to listen to this this really extraordinary panel, really, really appreciate it um, being part of it and to listen to you. It was, was a privilege and Nina, thank you to you as well. And to the other attendees who have patiently stayed till 10, 11 minutes past our closing time, but we will wrap it up now. And again, thank you for everybody. Take care and keep well, thank you. Oh, thank you, Sancia, for the panel and all of you on the panel. I really appreciate it. And I think it's a great way to end this first day. Um, tomorrow, we will pick up again. Um, and we will be dealing with, we'll be sort of moving into some of the more administrative areas, um, the issues about administrative appeals, access to appeals, and also the role of legal privilege 
in the protection of taxpayer rights. And I think some of that also goes to some of the things that Asha talked about before about the role of the legal profession in some of the work with illicit tax havens, um, re illicit revenue flows, but also you know, some of the bedrock principles about access to justice. So um, stay tuned and we will see you all tomorrow. And thank you everyone for attending. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you so much.